There we go. Well, welcome everyone here to the February 9th meeting of the KC Downtowners. Um, for those of you who may not know, if you're the first time here, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Uh, as you might guess from our name, the KC Downtowners, we're an informal uh, group that uh, uh, from all walks of life that are just passionate about downtown Kansas City. We've been getting together now for, for 20 years uh, for monthly uh, luncheons to talk about downtown and have interesting speakers. And for the last two years, like so many others, we've been doing that on Zoom. So using my college math, I think uh, two years of uh, virtual to uh, 20 years total, that's like 10% of the time. It's kind of crazy to think about now. But, uh, but uh, as we move through the year, we'll, we'll eventually get back together very soon. Um, Speaking of downtown, you know, one of the issues that uh, uh, is, is important is, uh, is uh, healthy food. And so I'm really pleased to introduce Caprice Taylor with Convy's Market. Um, you know, uh, one pleasant, nice thing that's kind of come out of the fact that as we've gone to these virtual meeting for, uh, formats is that we really uh, wanted to encourage everyone who, who participates to, in lieu of the traditional, you know, luncheon uh, fee that we, we held, please consider donating to these nonprofits that we, uh, we champion. And this month is, I think, particularly appropriate uh, as we uh, are introduced to Deprice and she tells us about Convy's Market. So Deprice, uh, uh, welcome, and we're excited to hear, hear the story. After two years, I'm still learning to get off of mute. So I apologize. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Deprice Taylor. I'm the Director of Community Engagement uh, here at Canby's Markets. And I just wanna thank you all first for, for having me and allowing me this platform to be able to talk about the great work that we're doing to eliminate food insecurity here in Kansas City. And so typically when I do these uh, presentations to increase awareness and, and visibility, I like to get a little bit of involvement. So as we get into this, I like everyone to think about where you live and the number of grocery stores uh, or, or places that you have access to go to shop within, a, let's just say a half a mile or a mile. So if you could throw some of those numbers into the chat. So whether that's a Target, whether that's your local hy V, your Constantino's, just think about the places that you easily have access to uh, when it comes to grocery shopping. Think about the affordability and then think about whether you have uh, transportation, reliable transportation to get to those places. And so I'll introduce you to Canby's Markets. So Canby's Markets is a nonprofit that works to eliminate in food insecurity by providing uh, fresh, uh, fresh, affordable uh, fruits and vegetables to those who don't have access. Um, and I like to use the word equitable access because for us, you know, we can make sure that people have food, but if it's not affordable, if it's not within the vicinity where lack of transportation is available, then it means nothing. If people don't have the equipment to make those, uh, that fresh fruit, that fresh vegetables, uh, then it doesn't matter. And so that's what we do here at Canby's. In order to do so, we work with a number of different models, but our main flagship model is our healthy corner stores. And so we partner with local bodegas, local convenience stores, local gas stations. And I don't know why my screen is messing up. I do apologize. Um, it's not coming through to you all. You might, oh, on. I did, there you go. There we go. And so that's what a cooler looks like in one of our convenience stores in our gas station. So, we partner with local convenience stores, gas station, mom and pops locations to put these cooler kiosks into their uh, facilities. And so most of our locations, 41 of those locations are all East of Truce. We just opened two uh, here on the Southwest Boulevard. And so right now we're in the vicinity of about 200,000 Kansas Cityans. So if you're not familiar with you know, food insecurity rates, one in three children um, face food insecurity. And so just think about you as an adult going to work, um, you know, not having breakfast, not having nutritious food, 
what that means in terms of your concentration, you being able to focus and then put those on a, on a small child, not being able to have access to fresh foods um, and fresh vegetables. And so for, I wanna talk a little bit about just our model. And so as we do this model here at Canby's Markets with these 43 locations, uh, we work with two wholesalers, CNC Produce and then Liberty Fruit. So the same organizations and companies that provide your fruits and vegetables to Constantinos, to Price Choppers, to your high bees. But we're able to do it at a, at a, a rate that's more you know, cost effective for us because we're doing it in such bulk. A large percentage of what we purchase um, from, these, from these wholesalers goes into those corner stores, but we also get a certain percentage that is donated as well. And so by taking in a certain percentage at donated price, we can also provide uh, fruits and vegetables to organizations, not other nonprofit organizations. Over the course of 2021, uh, we donated over 65,000 pounds of produce. And so this model also allows for 30% of the revenue to go back into that corner store. So we're making sure that 30% of those funds go back into the community. And we have a criteria when we're talking about these locations, you know, does the owner live within the neighborhood? Are they vested in the neighborhood? Um, those are some of the things that we look at. Or is, it a, is it a high health food priority area for us? And then we also uh, compost a lot of this. So we try to eliminate as much waste as possible. Our drivers go out seven days a week to ensure freshness and quality because it's about, uh, although these peop our people, our neighbors, I like to call them, are in low income neighborhoods, we still deserve the, the Driscoll strawberries. We still deserve the, the blueberries and the high uh, quality items as well. So we're going out checking for freshness and uh, high quality as well. So seven days a week, they go out. Everything is on consignment. So that piece of equipment that I showed you all, this is a $2,500 piece of equipment. There's no upfront cost to any of the store owners. And again, like I said, that 30% goes back into the community as well. Our other flagship program is similar to Meals on Wheels and is funded by Mid-America Regional Council. So we provide uh, about 25,000 meals per month out to those uh, at a, who are most vulnerable, our most vulnerable populations, those who are elderly and disabled. And we do that five days a week. So they get about two weeks worth of meals um, that we provide out. And I know I don't have a lot of time. I've kind of condensed this, this presentation down a, a lot, but I did want to leave a little bit of time for any questions uh, that, that you all may have. And just to touch a little bit on how you can get involved it's really something that you have to see up close. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Joe Goldberg, I had him come out to the location, to the warehouse when we first started. And I had to explain to him, you know, it's something that you really have to see the logistics of to be able to understand it. So if you're looking to volunteer or you like a tour, I'll leave my contact on the next slide as well so you can reach out to me. We also have a monthly program called our Grassroots Growers Program where you can contribute monthly, uh, ranging from 10 to $100 per month. We also have opportunities for you, your business, to sponsor a cooler. So as you can see on this cooler, this is sponsored by Evergy. Uh, we have coolers sponsored by Driscoll's. So we have coolers sponsored by Jackstack. Uh, so if you're interested, please reach out to me and I can get you with our development team in order to do so. And then we have our Canby's Fest, which is our annual uh, celebration here at the warehouse. I sat here intentionally because the trucks are usually going in and out and it's a nice visual behind me, but the sun is out and you guys can't see it. But um, and then you can follow us on social media at, at Canby's Markets on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those good places. So I don't know if I've gone over my time. I've spit that out really quickly, but I love to answer any questions if you all have any, or you, here's my contact information. That's my cell phone number. Shoot me a text. Give me a call if you're wanting to come by or, or learn more. Priest, thank you so much. Uh, the we can put that contact information in the chat too, I believe. So I, I loved hearing about, I mean, so many different ways that people can participate. Uh, you mentioned, you know, tours, volunteer opp uh, opportunities, uh, corporate sponsorship of those, uh, uh, the cooler kiosks. Um, uh, what other ways might, might uh, those folks on the call here be able to help? I mean, uh, is there just simple donation that we can go to your website and if so we'll, we'll certainly be happy to put that in the uh, yeah absolutely we're still a fairly new organization so always visit you know visibility and awareness 
is great for us. So if you can get the word about, out about what we're doing, um, we love for you all to do that. But that monthly growers program, um, you can find that on our website. And again, those range from 10 to $100. And you can sign up monthly. One thing that I forgot, and I always, I have to mention this, um, we were announced as a change maker recipient for Triscuit. And Triscuit is the cracker cookie crumble company. And we were announced as the second and Michelle Obama was the first. Her announcement came on Ellen. So I always like to say uh, that we're in good company. So um, that's not too bad for us as a new startup. So um, thank you all for this platform. And I appreciate you all just taking the time to listen to what we're doing here at Canby's. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. I also, I hope everybody else wrote May 1st down for it, for Condi Fest. That, uh, that uh, sounds like that'll be a great time. And it's uh, just nice to think about things in the spring again. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, speaking of sponsorships and, and corporate sponsorships at that, I'm uh, pleased now to introduce Jason Osborne, who, uh, in addition to being a vice president here for the KC Downtowners, he's going to put on his uh, Roseman and Associates hat today uh cover up all that hair that he's got and uh tell us about roseman associates we're jason on a serious note we're really grateful that, that you're sponsoring this month you know you're uh you're located in the downtown area and we uh we love uh, uh having our downtown uh, corporate partners uh, be a part of this so jason tell us tell us more about roseman if i can get it to unmute you know if i sat in the same space as the priest that son would blind everyone on this call, <laughs> reflecting off that shiny bald head of mine. Uh, obviously, thanks for having me, DePries. Thanks so much for, for being on the call today and sharing more about Canby's Market. It's it, it, a fascinating story, and it's an amazing program that you guys have. And I think such a wonderful contribution to the city of Kansas City. And obviously, it serves as a model for other communities that need to take uh, direction from you guys and leading the way for creating these uh, elimination of food deserts and other uh, issues that are happening <clears throat> that a lot of folks may not even be aware. And I think that's fun to, to be able to bring that to uh, the KC downtowners and have folks that may not have even heard about something like this and, you know, spark that aha moment where we can get involved and, you know, help partner with folks like you to really make a legitimate difference. And that's exciting. Um, I had ambitions to share a screen, but I can't get my my computer to cooperate with me either. Maybe that's just a uh, condition of it being Monday part three for me. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief rundown for those of you that don't know Roseman and Associates. We are an architecture firm that also houses a structural engineering department uh, within the group. We've been around since 1987, um, kind of part and parcel to how DePriest's group uh, cooperates with the local communities. Uh, Roseman and Associates solved its identity crisis 35 years ago when we opened our doors. We opened as a residential architecture firm, meaning we specialize in multifamily. We work with senior living communities, and that has uh, branched into a little bit of uh, student housing. But the majority of our, our 35 years in existence has held a focus on the affordable housing, which now has morphed into workforce housing and other types of uh, housing for specifically intentionally for uh, a maybe a lower income communities or people that live uh, at or below the area median income. And we're now doing that in 31 states. So just as a point of pride, right, we get to create housing for people, but we also get to participate in a large uh, percentage of that in participating for, for people who are just hardworking Americans that are having a hard time making ends meet for one variety of reason or another. And that's kind of fun. Um, you know, so I think uh, the 34 states that we've been able to branch out to uh, has allowed us to grow into four, uh, four different uh, office locations uh, here in Kansas City, St. Louis, Denver, and Atlanta. Um, I guess the thing I would leave you with is obviously if there's a question about architecture with no hidden agenda that I can help answer ever, you know, certainly I'm, I'm around to answer questions or point you in the right direction. Uh, I would say that our focus being in housing means that if you call me and ask a question about how to design or develop uh, a hospital or a warehouse or some other thing that's outside that purview, would be happy to point you in the direction of uh, other folks who are probably sitting on this call that do have specialties in those, those arenas. So with that, thank you for letting me sponsor. Appreciate you letting me speak. If I can ever answer a question, I'm easy to get a hold of. Stan, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so thank you so much. I, I, expect, I am very appreciative that you personally for your involvement to Casey Downtowners for Roseman Associates, all that you do in the downtown and the greater Kansas City area. 
and we certainly just appreciate appreciate your sponsorship this month. Uh, and so now we're going to to get to our featured speaker, uh, Bill Dietrich. And uh, I know uh, hopefully some of you have been excited with some of the recent news stories uh, a couple of weeks ago. The uh, Imagine Downtown KC strategic plan uh, launch party that took place at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Uh, Bill, I know you've kind of been uh, making the, the rounds here, uh, sh sharing the story. So I'm going to quickly read, read your bio and then I'm going to turn it over to you so that we can leave the balance of the time to, to hear this uh, great presentation. Uh, Bill Dietrich has served as president and CEO of the Downtown Council of Kansas City, Missouri since June 2002. Bill has played a leading role uh, in implementing downtown's revitalization strategy. He has developed the DTC into an effective urban management group, implementing a wide range of revitalization strategies. Initiatives under the DTC's umbrella include the development and management of multiple community improvement districts, delivering $4.5 million annually of public space maintenance, landscaping, safety, development, and marketing services. Recently, the DTC facilitated the development of the next 10-year strategic plan for downtown, Imagine Downtown KC 2030. The Imagine Downtown KC 2030 plan is designed to serve as the primary vision setting and policy group blueprint for shaping a stronger, better, or resilient community with an unflinching commitment to creating an equitable, inclusive, and vibrant downtown Kansas City. Um, spoiler, I've, I've heard you speak a couple times now, Bill, so I, I, I tell everybody that this is gonna be great. I'm really excited to hear about some of the catalytic projects and the, and the uh, uh, inclusive strategies that uh, you have mapped out for downtown. So Bill, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Stan. Can everybody, can you, uh, the audio is coming through okay? Um, well, thank you so much, Stan, for the, for the invitation. Um, speaking to the downtowners is a real privilege for us. I, I really think uh, the downtowners is one of the truly vanguard organizations uh, and thought leadership in revitalizing downtown. Um, so you've been a great partner uh, from, gosh, 2002 through today. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to come uh, share this plan with you and get your feedback. It's a living document. It's a framework plan. So we're, we're continuously taking, you know, taking input on the plan um, and encourage the, encourage the downtowners to, give, you know, to do that as well. Um, I also want to introduce Ann Holliday, who's with me today, Vice President Downtown Council. Uh, she's been very involved in the managing and shaping the plan that you see today. So uh, she'll back me up on some questions if I don't have the answers, or I'll be putting some links in uh, on information for you. Um, so, um, so let's get started. Um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, downtown was a very different place. Uh, blocks and blocks and blocks of urban blight. Um, you, we had 65,000 employees and shrinking, uh, 70,000 uh, residents hanging on. Um, I always think it's emblematic that Main Street was a one-way street heading south. Uh, and downtown had been uh, designed by traffic engineers to be evacuated in five minutes. Um, you know, deferred maintenance for many, many years and uh, um, hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance um, in downtown. And it looked really bad. Uh, and it was really on the threshold of being lost um, to becoming a donut city where you had an empty core, an empty economic engine. As leadership and uh, politically and economically moved out in concentric rings, so it really was in a very difficult place. Um, but you know, 20 years later, uh, nine and a half billion dollars of investment later, uh, 32,000 people called downtown home. We're up to 123,000 employees post pre-COVID, um, and it, it's a very different environment today. And again, I just, I just want to thank you all for being very much a part of that and being in the vanguard of helping bring downtown back to where we are today. And we have such a great place from here moving forward um, that, that uh, hopefully we can kind of capture this plan. It's a very different looking plan than, than, than the one that was done uh, 20 years ago. Um, this plan is two years in the making. Uh, most of the time was spent on community engagement. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the plan itself is 100 plus pages also has an implementation schedule section to it, and we invested very heavily in metrics um, so we can measure where we're making progress or we're not making progress. And those are a very diverse set of metrics, as I think you'll kind of get the flavor as we, we go through the plan. Um, these are the previous strategic plans uh, done for downtown. Um, interesting, the two on the left 
part of the downtown corridor development strategy done by Sasaki Associates back in 2000. Um, really advented in um, in uh, making a, really laid a great framework for many of the uh, uh, initiatives that you've seen come to fruition in downtown, uh, as from as diverse as the Power Light District to T-Mobile Center, Revitalized Convention Center, Convention Hotel. Um, thriving arts colony and, and community and ecosystem throughout downtown, streetcar, many things that we see today were inside that plan. And it really was a plan that focused on the central business district, river market, and the crossroads, and it had to. Uh, that was, uh, again, we were very close to losing our downtown. Um, it was a top-down uh, planning process, um, so some leadership individuals got together and, and, and uh, kind of focused very much uh, like a laser beam on, on that central business district. Um, and uh, and then probably, what's the date on that? Back in 17, we brought uh, ULI National to, to town. That's that call to action in the middle. Um, and they really did a study for us on, could we lose the North Loop and recapture all that real estate for investment uh, and reconnect the river market in the central business district? Um, and it really came out with kind of three uh, findings and recommendations. And the first was, yes, you can. Uh, but you got lots of infill uh, opportunities yet to go, so let's put that out 10 years. Um, two, you know, your strategic plan is 20 years old, and you, well, at that point, it was 18, 17 years old. You've pretty much done it, uh, what can be done, and you need a new strategic plan. Uh, and the third was, you know, and as we look around the room, of uh, uh, everyone who was receiving the ULI presentation, uh, this group does not look representative of the community in your downtown. You need to be intentionally and thoughtfully more diverse than you are today reach more voices and get more people involved in that planning process for the future of your downtown looks like. Um, so we took that very much to heart. Um, and uh, meetings with Troy Schulte back then, city manager, uh, he challenged us. He really felt strongly that, again, the strategic plan should come from outside City Hall, from uh, downtown stakeholders. Uh, inside City Hall, you have that, the, the greater downtown area plan which is done by, led by the city of Kansas City. And it really tells everyone inside City Hall, you know, what the goals are for the, for the, for the city, where infrastructure should go, what are the major uh, kind of opportunities, what's permitting, what's the zoning, all those kind of things you need when you're talking to the development community about what you want to see in your greater downtown as a city. Um, and finally, uh, as well as the Casey Playbook, which is an ongoing update of that plan today. Um, this plan that, that, that we're going to share with you has, we're, and we're going to take a very high view of it, has 189 recommendations throughout it, um, uh, as well as, um, uh, and we're just gonna kind of look at some of the, the major categories of that. Uh, it's posted on our website, downtownkc.org, um, and we'll, we'll also give you some other links links uh, to, the, to the plan. Um, uh, please go there, we can go into a lot of detail on the plan, uh, give us your feedback. It's very important because again, this is a living document uh, that we need to keep contemporary and relevant moving forward. Um, this planning process also very differently uh, than the one 20 years ago uh, is a grassroots planning process. Um, and we really wanted to ensure um, that as we look at this study area, which is greater downtown, these boundaries mirror the city's greater downtown area plan boundaries. It's 22 unique neighborhoods, each with its own heritage, history, culture, aspirations. Um, and we, as the downtown council, as facilitating this process, did not want to take for granted that we knew it was important in all these neighborhoods. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were really focused on, um, on listening to neighborhoods and, and, and understanding each neighborhood has, has a different set of development goals, uh, livability goals, affordability goals. Uh, I love the conversation earlier, Jason, around the, the food desert, which and we're talking about a 15-minute walk neighborhood. You should have every service you need within 15 minutes of your home. Uh, uh, grocery stores, daycare centers, transit, connection to jobs. Um, and, and we have a lot of work to do there, of course. So we really want to make sure that, this, that we spend a lot of time doing community engagement. Um, you know, a key, to, uh, um, a key to the success of this plan, well, let me, let me take a step back. When you look at this area, that first plan 20 years ago focused on three very core neighborhoods of River Market Central Business and Crossroads. Um, there was $9.5 billion of investment since then uh, created through, that, through, the, through the revitalization of downtown. 
Um, but that wealth creation has not been experienced equitably by all the neighborhoods in, in our greater downtown. The key goal of this plan uh, is to impact those downtown adjacent neighborhoods positively with that type of wealth creation and keep expanding that circle of new investment and, and growth. Um, it, one, for the livability, for quality of life. Two, really from the river to, um, let's say, Yield KC, uh, down that spine is the economic engine of your city. That engine feeds revenues to neighborhoods. And the healthier those neighborhoods are, the healthier that economy is. The healthier the economy is, the healthier those neighborhoods are. Their fates are connected, right? Their well being. We need to acknowledge that in our thinking um, that we need safe, healthy neighborhoods where people have up, uh, opportunity uh, for, for growth and wealth creation within our neighborhoods. So we really tried to tackle that in this planning process. Um, this plan looks through the lens of economic inclusion. Uh, it's, it's all about building partnerships and bridges between neighborhoods and expanding the revitalization uh, into those downtown adjacent neighborhoods while continuing it, uh, you know, obviously, in the, in the core areas. So a little bit about that uh, extensive community engagement process. The uh, first thing we did, we set up a steering committee. That steering committee for the planning process had over 40 members on it. Uh, those 40 members represented each of those neighborhoods. Uh, they also represented content experts, residents, large and small property owners, business owners, nonprofits, charities, uh, anyone who's a stakeholder in downtown. Uh, we very intentionally and thoughtfully uh, uh, created a matrix where we said, no, we need broad representation on this. We need to listen to those voices. We spent a year facilitating this community engagement, difficult during COVID, um, but unlike the 2000 study, which was a top-down exercise, uh, again, this one uh, really needed to have a listening tour, a component of that, uh, that uh, uh, asked the questions, created the venues, but really listened to the environment. We did that through uh, six focus groups, uh, which were done, they were kind of topic-oriented, transportation, affordability, catalytic development, residential growth, you know, really focusing on the different uh, 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 market segments in, in, in downtown. We did two community conversations. Those were really with east side and west side residents, business owners, and organizations on what, what was important uh, in those neighborhoods. And part of that's relationship building. Uh, if this plan is to be successful, we need to have better working relationships and communication mm -hmm. networks. So it's kind of first step in reaching out um, beyond those central uh, areas uh, into neighborhoods. Um, we did 18 neighborhood meetings with organizations throughout the, that greater downtown area, two online community conversations with Zoom. Um, interesting enough, we're attended by more than 200 people each, each session. And in some ways, you know, with Zoom, uh, it removes barriers to participation because you can be sitting at your home and, and still, you know, clock in and, and participate in, in a community engagement process. Kind of what's lost is that 15 minutes before and after where, you know, people get to chat and network and, you know, great ideas come up. But, but our, our consulting group, which was actually MIG, we did a, a national search for a consulting firm, uh, shows how Kansas City is on the national uh, radar screen. We had 27 companies compete for that contract, the best of the best. Um, we ended up choosing MIG uh, with our local partners, Confluence, uh, Parson uh, Associates, uh, CityFi, and EPS, Economic Planning Systems, who did the economic study uh, component of, of the, of the uh, study. Uh, so we had a really great team who, who helped lead us through this process. Uh, we did 20 one-on-one -on -one interviews with, and these were really with uh, major employers, major property owners, major businesses, because you want to know it's important to everyone, right? From those major employers to, to uh, uh, people who are residents or nonprofits who are also working on environment. And um, then finally, we did 10 Imagine Downtown podcasts. Uh, these were facilitated by a, a great young urbanist named Kevin Coleman. Uh, they were conversations with uh, individuals as diverse as uh, Tom Guerin, with the, who heads the Streetcar Authority, uh, to Dr. Kimberly, ba Kimberly Beatty, who uh, is the chancellor at the Metropolitan Community College System. Um, and they're on their website, so you can kind of check those out. They're really interesting. So we took all that information, a uh, year of listening, really just you know listening to her, what's important in the neighborhoods and downtown, all the neighborhoods, all 22 of them. Um, and out of that was synthesized. Uh, this vision statement, I just want to kind of read it quickly, which is, we envision an equitable and inclusive and vibrant downtown. Kansas City, a downtown Kansas City that will thrive in coming years and decades, an equitable downtown, 
reflects the diversity of Kansas City and its residents, employees, institutions, and organizations. Ensures that economic development resources benefit every neighborhood uh, and combats systemic racism directly and overtly. Our diversity is our strength in greater downtown. Uh, an inclusive downtown invests in historically disenfranchised communities, proactively engages all neighborhoods in determining the future of downtown, provides opportunities for people of all abilities to participate in everything downtown has to offer, uh, and, and a vibrant downtown preserves its history and culture while welcoming new ideas and opportunities. You know, those really cool different heritage uh, and cultures with each one of our neighborhoods. Uh, how do you promote growth but maintain that identity, uh, maintain those cultures? Concentrate on delivering an excellent experience for all uh, and focuses equally on supporting quality design, arts, and culture, and a strong economy. So how are we gonna do that? Um, these are the goals that came out of the vision statement. Ensure a livable city for all, connect downtown neighborhoods, nurture a prosperous, innovative, and creative economy, preserve and enhance our unique assets, uh, and make downtown sustainable and green. Um, and how you do that, this is where we kind of get to the meat of the program. Um, really develop six transformative strategies and eight catalytic projects that came out. And some of these are big ticket items, uh, and some of these are relatively cost-free. They're changing the way we do business. So there's a, a lot of thought given uh, to uh, making sure that we had a continuum of projects uh, and recommendations as well um, as uh, at that, that kind of financing level, uh, as well as uh, chronologically. There are things happening right today. There are some things that are years out. There's things that are farther out. You never get to start a planning process or redevelopment of a downtown at the beginning. You're always kind of in process. So these were the the transformative strategies uh, that came out, out, of that, uh, out of that planning process. First is the mosaic of neighborhoods. Uh, the, the, this is a recognition, again, that diversity is our strength. Each neighborhood has its own heritage. We need to preserve and enhance those unique characters, work, within, work with neighborhood leaders and organizations to support and leverage economic development projects within the neighborhoods, including retail and business recruitment, uh, we need to establish a communication network that's very robust to exchange information, uh, including online tools, and really co-promote and brand and market our downtown in a, at a higher level than we have in the past. Again, there's synergies between these neighborhoods and how do we work more closely together. A second is a smart and healthy infrastructure. Uh, we need our downtown to be resilient. Um, we've been uh, very fortunate coming through COVID uh, uh, our downtown really remains ready to reopen. Uh, many downtowns across America are in much more difficult situations than we are. We've been able to kind of preserve the, the advances we've made. Um, you know, but of course, we're all hoping that, that the pandemic ends shortly because it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, taxing on all of us. Um, so how, how resilient your downtown helps you weather these kind of economic downturns and, and kind of, uh, uh, in our case, the, globally, this pandemic. Um, that means focusing, focusing on smart city technologies um, as, as mundane, but important as sewer and stormwater separation for the environment. Uh, High-speed fiber to every home. One of the things we learned was west of Truce, 98% of the households are, are connected to the internet. East of Truce, it falls to 60%. How do you participate in the 21st century economy without access to the internet? We need to change that. Um, but other things as well, as uh, such as rain, rain uh, Rain garden, rooftop greening, community gardens, recycling stations, uh, running trails, fitness clubs, encourage reuse of historic buildings, um, et cetera. So um, uh, historic buildings as affordable housing and creative office space. So again, anything in that, uh, 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 that makes our downtown more resilient and able to, to weather uh, bad downturns. Um, housing for all is the third category. Uh, this is, this, it, Downtown today remains uh, an affordable downtown. Uh, many of our peer cities, I'll throw Nashville out there, which I love dearly, is not an affordable downtown. Um, but that doesn't stay without intentional strategies to maintain the affordability while allowing growth to go forward. So the housing for all is really focused on, on maintaining uh, affordability, maintaining residents who live in our neighborhoods. We don't want to redevelop a, um, all our neighborhoods and force the residents who, uh, who have lived there for many years out of their homes, right? You want them to benefit in the growth. 
uh, to maintain that authentic history and that authentic heritage are very challenging. You do that through things like establishing a social and community impact fund, uh, create a grant fund for emergency repair assistance for single homeowners, identifying displacement risks and working with the city land bank to reserve affordable housing sites, uh, and establishing housing trust funds. Uh, and finally, to promote things like the concept that came out of uh, Gould Evans' work with Urban 3, um, looking at can we take auxiliary dwelling units and make them available as affordable uh, housing opportunities. Right now, if you're a single parent living on the east side, you have a home, you have a built out basement, by zones and regulations, you can't rent that out. Um, that needs to change. Uh, a lot of, lot of issues around that, but if we could change that, you could offer an already built out affordable unit, help that person pay their mortgage and create wealth in their family and stabilize the neighborhood. You know, what's wrong with that picture? It doesn't cost a lot of money, has a lot of risk. A 21st century jobs and recovery, uh, continue innovative efforts to support local retail through the pandemic, like outdoor dining uh, on the sidewalk or in parking places that lets them serve more customers. Um, support the arts KC resiliency plan. One of the market segments that's been hit the hardest by the pandemic is the arts community. Uh, uh, without the federal support that's been ongoing, uh, we would have lost many of our, our, our cultural and art institutions. Uh, how do we help them reemerge post pandemic? Uh, support initiatives like Launch KC, uh, which is a grant program that focuses on bringing startup, innovative technology-based companies to our downtown. Uh, best thing we've ever done for small business. We need to continue to grow that, that, those types of programs. Um, connect local students to businesses through internships. Retain, um, retain existing major employers. Uh, ideas uh, around identifying new inventory opportunities or kind of future office, that safe, technology-appropriate office space that new companies are looking for. And, uh, next on our list would be seamless mobility. Uh, this, 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 actually, this is a great, a really great picture. This is a picture of the Green Line, which we'll talk a little bit about one of the catalytic projects, 10-mile uh, walking trails that would connect neighborhoods uh, with pedestrian and, and bicycle kind of trails and really cool amenities along the way. But seamless mobility really talks about you know, continuing the zero fare for transit. I talk about removing obstacles to, for people to connect to jobs, uh, getting, getting national recognition, but we need to figure out how to sustain that over time. Uh, prioritize east-west routes, support bike and pet amenities, implement complete street policies, uh, look at things like parking benefit districts, how do you share parking and get more value out of that? Because we are we are an auto-dependent culture today, and we will be for the short term in the future. So we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're accommodating multi-modalities of transportation. Uh, and finally, things like the streetcar expansion, already happening north and south, how do we get across the river? What's the first east-west transit route with streetcar, right? Is it reconnecting Independence? Is it 18th? Is it 12th? Is it 31st? Connecting the hospitals on 39th? A lot of options, a lot of great studies, too, and we look forward to working with folks like Tom Gearing and the Streetcar Authority and looking into those kinds of strategies. Um, and finally, a green and beautiful city. And this really, we're, we're still a very hardscape downtown. We need a lot more tree plantings. We need much more landscaping, rooftop gardens, um, you know, uh, lowering that carbon footprint, uh, update green space. We need to update the green space plan, um, prioritize pedestrian access, support neighborhood events, and reimagine and reinvigorate parks and plazas. Urban areas, public spaces need to be programmed. And there's some great examples out there from the High Line to Bryant Park to Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, in New York to Clyde Warren Park in, uh, in Dallas. Um, we've got some great public spaces. We're looking to create some more. But how do you proactively manage those to, to be a real benefit for the community? The next area I want to take a quick look at are these catalytic projects. Um, catalytic projects, kind of the definition of a catalytic project is a project that spins off additional community benefits um, and investment. A great example in our marketplace course is the streetcar. $100 million streetcar starter line. In the years since it uh, has gone into operation, actually the year before, um, over $3.5 billion have been invested along that streetcar line. Uh, and we talked to those developers, and, and most are national. Uh, and you know they, they say things like, you know, I look around the country and where I see these kind of investments going in, I come to that city and I see if there's an opportunity to make an investment. Um, and, uh, you know, but for your streetcar, I wouldn't even look at Kansas City. Two, um, yeah, weighed heavily in our thinking. It was a big part of our kind of calculation looking at it. But transitory development's a reality. It's happened downtown. And you're going to see that happen right down Main Street to UMKC. 
it'll look different. It'll be a different density, but you're going to continue to see that, that catalytic effect of that major infrastructure investment. So that's kind of a great definition of what's a, what's a catalytic project in our kind of world. Um, so the, the catalytic projects that were identified through, again, hundreds of people's involvement and input were east-west connections, we knew much better, innovation districts, parks, open spaces, and plazas, streetcar expansion, uh, loop reimagination, potential for downtown ballpark, uh, street reimagination, how do we use our streets? Uh, that's a great shot, by the way, of an alleyway that used to be where the Kansas City Star's uh, paper would come up and down uh, between Grand and Walnut, kind of uh, Truman down to 18th. We could recapture that as a really cool, you know, retail uh, uh, kind of alley like, like we see in some more mature, more mature markets. And finally, arts, culture, and historic destination. Let's just do a little deeper dive into those, and then we'll wrap things up with some questions. Um, again, in the plan, there are 100, under each one of these categories, there's multiple project uh, and initiatives. But just kind of looking at the overview, if we think about East-West Connections, uh, right now in the Paseo Gateway, a lot of work being done uh, on the Paseo Gateway already in place and there's more to do uh, to really make that be a much stronger east-west connection support the university support residential growth uh, support human service uh, community that that uh, also uh, it is around that paseo uh, uh, gateway connection uh, 18th street corridor very underutilized it, it could really be your cultural uh, it could be your one of your cultural heritage streets uh, running from 18th down southwest boulevard you could make an amazing experience for people uh, and 12th Street, which is really our only street that runs from State Line Road to 435 on the east. It's the only street that goes all the way through uh, through our city. I might also throw out uh, ideas like Independence Avenue, although I guess I could have that under loop. Re yeah, re reimagination. So when you think about innovation districts, right now we have three. Uh, one is the Young KC Health Sciences District uh, around the hospitals. And you've seen the major new investments going on there. Uh, quietly, the UMKC Health Sciences District employs about 20,000 people. It's probably one of our major, you know, collectively, one of our major employment centers. How do we connect it to the city better? How do we get more transportation opportunities and continue the residential uh, development around that that uh, provides quality housing for those who work at the UMKC Health Sciences District? Very differently, the Crossroads Arts District, if anyone knows anything about Kansas City nationally other than the Chiefs and the Royals, um, what they know is, wow, you have a really great arts uh, community and a thriving artist ecosystem. We need to protect that. Innovative companies uh, like to be around innovative people. Um, and throughout the crossroads, uh, really led that kind of organic growth of, of having over you know, 89 art galleries and 100 restaurants and four or 500 re uh, artists who live in the neighborhood and work in the neighborhood. Uh, and then in the future uh, is the Keystone Innovation District. We, ha we have a, a huge boom uh, in innovative technology-based companies locating in our city and in our Town. Uh, what we don't have is a Keystone Innovation District. This is like Cortex in St. Louis. Almost every major market has one of these. This is where acad academic research from your major universities are housed together with business community, corporate. Uh, think about the design build community, which we are a leader in nationally. Uh, but what's, what's the next generation of design build technologies? Right? These are the folks who need the products. You bring them together with academicians, corporate community. And then the entrepreneurs in a single space with collision density that generates new ideas, new businesses, new opportunities. Huge priority. Um, parks and open spaces, we've got Barney Alps. Here's the green line, you kind of see a representative of it. But think of that, a 10 mile walking biking trail that connects the crossroads and all the great things happening there with 18th and Vine, with Cliff Drive, down the riverfront, which is exploding with growth. Uh, very exciting stuff by the new current stadium for women's professional soccer which breaks ground in the, in the summer. Um, the Buck O'Neill Bridge, which might be saved, which could be the old Buck O'Neill Bridge, which would be a park that went over the river adjacent to the new Buck O'Neill Bridge. Pretty unique, pretty exciting, pretty diff uh, as a product differentiator, really sets us apart. Um, to other underutilized assets like Washington Square Park uh, and, and a next residential and mixed-use neighborhood that's gonna explode on us is gonna be the West Bottoms. Uh, and we're right at the front end of beginning to look at what will be the needs of that. So really focusing thoughtfully and intentionally on these parks, open spaces, and plazas. Streetcar expansion, we've talked a lot about, so I'll just jump right by that. Uh, East-West uh, connections are the next big one, getting over the river, uh, which is a pretty exciting opportunity and understudy today. Uh, a downtown ballpark, today we have probably four or five sites that can still accommodate a downtown ballpark uh, for the Royals. Um, we're very excited and uh, 
thrilled that the Royals' new ownership group is going to look at all its options. That's the, and it's going to use criteria like, of course, what's best for the Royals, but what's best for the community? What gives us the biggest return on this investment? What has the potential to create catalytic opportunities? And we think downtown is a great option, of course, um, to do that. And we think we can help neighborhoods, we can help communities, we can create employment, uh, and we can capture that new value. Uh, dense urban areas uh, uh, have synergy between the unique assets invested in them. So the Performing Arts Center, T-Mobile Center, City Market, Union Station, uh, uh, Liberty Memorial, uh, these all have synergy. And you put a, a ballpark into that mix, uh, Power and Light District, um, and it will generate to you, if, if we're like any other market in America, it would generate between two and $4 billion of ancillary investment around that ballpark. Um, that's, that can only happen in a downtown where you have that those, the customer base to support those you know, years. So really exciting. We're thrilled that there will be a very public community engagement process, and we'll all be looking at the options as a community and deciding, you know, what's the next generation of our ballpark look like and where it's located at. Um, street reimagination, again, is just really how do we use our streets in a different way. I love that alley example I already gave you kind of coming up from between 18th and uh, Truman. Um, but but ideas like, uh, could we close uh, Delaware between 3rd and 5th to be a pedestrian only on the weekend? Um, 18th and Vine, pedestrian only on the weekend. Things that, you know, create, create better use of our streets uh, for, for more pedestrian. Now, Looper Imagination, these are big items. These two are future, um, but one's underway today. So one is like the North Loop. So you can see it highlighted here. You know, could you lose the North Loop, recapture all that real estate for investment, reconnect those neighborhoods, and correct those traffic engineers of the 60s, you know, disastrous decisions to run freeways through our neighborhoods and split our city into pieces. But how do we reweave that urban fabric? South Loop is a project that's ongoing currently, and that's looking at doing a four-block park that would cover I-670. Um, reconnecting the crossroads in the central business district and again uh, promoting uh, higher property valuations um, around it creating new you know new, uh, new uh, growing the tax base for the city uh, by by uh, leveraging the density of investment occurring along that corridor very exciting project it's uh, currently it's uh, been through visioning it's actually heading into engineering uh, in its initial round of EIS studies um, and other ideas like bridging park and market. You know, could we lower Highway 9 to grade, reconnect Columbus Park and the River Market, uh, create more open space, a lovely ramp up uh, up Highway 9 for the streetcar to get up to Burlington uh, for our first kind of real park and ride opportunity. So a lot of energy about how do we imagine that loop? You know, could we lose 70, reorient to 670, and fix that as a straighter transit car for interstate uh, transportation? And finally, and most really importantly, uh, uh, maintaining real focus on our arts and culture and our historic destinations. Uh, Union Station, which is going to be the host for the NFL draft in 2023, amongst many venues in downtown. We're really excited about that in Crown Center. Uh, River Market, you, you only have to drive down the riverfront to see the transformation occurring there, and that's going to continue. Um, and the West Bottoms in the future, again, it's poised uh, uh, to be the next uh, really area of, of a major renaissance. So, these are just kind of the highlights on those catalytic projects. Kind of where we are is the next steps is it, um, we really want to ensure that this plan is aligned with other plans. Um, as a community, we want to make sure that we all work closer together. The Civic Council uh, launched the KC Rising Initiative, which you can see many of their goals, uh, their areas of uh, pillars of prosperity reflect a lot of the recommendations in our plan from connectivity to helping neighborhoods, that growth of the enterprise and small business industry, inclusion, education, culture, uh, but making sure that we're, we're, we're working more closely with the Chamber of Commerce, the Civic Council, the Kansas City Area Development Council, of course, the City of Kansas City and the County of Jackson. Uh, and you have to, again, do that more intentionally than we have in the past. So achieve, to achieve that, uh, we are launching this month in February, our first meeting of the Imagine Downtown KC Implementation Committee, and this is its leadership. Uh, we're blessed that Jason Parson, Pars President CEO of Parson Associates, is going to chair the group the first two years. Uh, Vice Chair Lynn Carlton, who was the chair of the Downtown Council during plan development, uh, original leader of planning for HOK, will be our first vice chair. And then Vision Advancement Chair, Dr. Kimberly Beatty. And her focus will really be on that alignment piece to ensure we're creating new structures uh, where we could be meeting regularly to ensure we're all pulling yours the same way in our, in our lane. Um, and we're really excited by that. They'll really be tasked with advancing the strategic initiatives and catalytic projects outlined in the plan. Uh, oh, uh, excuse me. 
Uh, they're the leadership. Of course, we'll be putting around them a 25 to 30 person committee of neighborhood representatives, organizational representatives, content experts, uh, but really building that, uh, uh, that network so we can make sure that we hear voices from every one of those neighborhoods in that greater downtown plan. Um, so they will work with that. They will oversee that committee. Uh, they'll guide decision making through collaborative partnerships, ensure downtown wide feedback and input ongoing, uh, facilitate the coordination of communication and strategic decisions, and work to coordinate funding from public and private sources. Some of these initiatives are less expensive than others, right? But each one will have to have its own cost benefit analysis, its own pro forma, its own financing plan. So uh, this would be the body that would create committees, and we have several in place already who would advance those. We have a Green Line Committee today that's working that project. Um, but we'll also liaison with, with our organizations like uh, that are throughout the network who are, for instance, the city working on affordable housing policies are, are uh, LISC, who's doing a lot of work with affordability in neighborhoods. But, it, but this would be the entity that keeps and builds those relationships. And so here's kind of our next steps, uh, having that initial committee uh, meeting this month. Uh, we've just kind of gone through our launch, a lot of great media coverage and, and opportunities to talk to wonderful organizations like the downtowners. Um, and we will continue to provide neighborhood and organizational updates. We're happy to come back at any time and give you updates on how things are going or, or you know, make sure we have a good feedback communication loop. Uh, and, and then we'll be highlighting the strategic plan at our downtown annual luncheon in April. Um, and currently we are building on a social media campaign and social media network. Uh, connecting all those organizations together. Um, so a lot of work is done, but now is really where the real work begins, which is in plan implementation. We think it's so important to have an implementation committee. Uh, I've seen in my experience that when you don't, plans end up on shelves. But if you had a committed group of civic stakeholders and leaders like yourselves working those monthly or bi-monthly uh, into the future, you make real change. So we're really excited about where we are. Um, and I think I'll stop there, Stan, and, and thank you all very much for your time. and. Bill, thank you so much. That, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for that great uh, summation and overview. And it's, you know, it's just exciting to think about uh, with everything that's happened with downtown and, and the surrounding environments in recent years, and that, that this is you know going to continue. And you said uh, a phrase a couple times that uh, uh, I think is worth celebrating: diversity is our strength. And you know, the, here you hear the phrase, you know, that house or that. The structure has good bones and it goes beyond bricks and mortar really it's about the people and, and the the energy and the support that we have for each other um we'll, we'll get into some questions here and uh i'll just go as a top to bottom as i scroll so rick uh, usher asks uh how do we harness infrastructure funds for mitigating damages urban freeways have wrought on our neighborhoods there's a loaded question. Thank that's you. Good. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we're currently working with, um, out of the strategic plan, um, we developed uh, really a, a list of, of what the infrastructure uh, projects uh, we thought were the high priority in, in downtown. Um, and we have met with, uh, right now the, the mayor has a uh, lead person in the mayor's office who is coordinating and collecting information from all organizations on, on their priority list for infrastructure investments. Uh, Jill, and is this correct? Jill Lawler is the individual at the, at the, uh, in the mayor's office. We met with them just the other day. Uh, and uh, Megan uh, Sade, who is chief of staff. Um, uh, so we met with them uh, just the other day to give them our input. Um, we're working closely with the uh, other uh, civic organizations like Chamber of Commerce on that uh, infrastructure list that's making sure that our downtown and our greater downtown projects are included in those regional regional portfolio, as well as we're meeting with Mid-America Regional Council to ensure that they understand what our priorities are in, in greater downtown. Um, and we we are also working with the governor's office. So this list is also being supplied to the governor's office to make sure um, if um, there's a great study, and Ann might give them that link to, uh, our Buckle Mill Bridge Aesthetics Committee. It's kind of neat. It's uh, looking at the new Buckle Mill uh, Buck Bridge. We want to make sure that it, you know, honored Buck um in, in his heritage and legacy to our city, but also is very proactive with the program space. So it has things like a skateboard park underneath. I thought it was really cool when uh, President Biden came to town to talk about the infrastructure bill. He's posed in front of a, of a graphic of the Broadway Bridge. 
And so we actually had a chance to chat with them about that. There's a lot of excitement for some of these projects at the federal level. Um, and, um, and so we'll be working collectively uh, and cooperatively with our mayor, uh, our county exec and their team uh, and our governor on, on that as well. Uh, but both, both two of the ones that we talked about, just not go too much minutia, but uh, losing the I-70 on the north and reorient to 670 to become the new I-70, as well as then uh, litting with a, with, a, with a Clyde Warren and Dallas style park uh, over uh, 670. Um, have both gotten major feedback uh, from uh, the infrastructure uh, kind of federal group working on that as um, very, very shovel worthy projects. I think, Ann, correct me if I'm wrong, I 70 on the north was rated as one of the, who, who did that study in? Well, rated as one of the 10 worst freeways in America that had to go away. <laughs> right. That was so, the Congress for New Urbanism. We, we made it on their list this year. Kind of a dubious list, but also motivational list. So, thank you, Rick. Long-winded answer. I'm sorry, but there's there's a lot of coordination happening right now to ensure that at least our voice is heard in that in that conversation. Very good. Thank you for the question, Rick, and thank you for for that uh, re response, um, uh, Bill. You know, talked about the fact that we've had these man-made you know urban freeways from you know. The, 50s and 60s that wreaked havoc on downtown, but we do have one natural freeway that is, you know, an asset that I think is finally being recognized as such, which is the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. And as you, you know, look at the uh, the map that you showed, and and I love the kind of the arrows indicating connections, right? And you talked a lot about, you know, exciting uh, development on, on the riverfront on the south side. Uh, I'm curious to maybe get your thoughts as to how this might, you know. Also, what you might envision for the north side, and we have a couple questions here actually in, in regard to the uh, the Boca Nail Bridge that you mentioned that I'll, I'll I'll piggyback onto in the time we have left. But uh, okay. just curious your thoughts on that. Um, downtown, uh, Greater Downtown uh, uh, is a heart of a city, which is a heart of a region. Um, we're reaching out and working much more closely with um, Unified Government Government in Wyandotte County. Uh, you know, their downtown is poised for revitalization, and they've got a very progressive government who is looking at some really neat kind of innovative strategies. One of them, just a, you know, one obvious one that we talk about is, is connecting the Green Line uh, to, to the trail system in, in KCK, you know, that wraps around the car, but making it more of a seamless experience for residents. Uh, uh, Mike Zellers is working on a great project called the Rock Island Bridge, uh, which goes over the car, kind of uh, down there by Hybee Center. Which is you know great uh, youth sports location, uh, but it would have things like you know paddle boats and retail and just a lot of fun stuff to do for people, um, and it crosses the river. It's between two states, and we think you know we're more stronger when we work together. Um, you've only had to so the part two of that answer is you only have to drive up uh, uh, Burlington over Highway Nine to see the growth and the, the wonderful renaissance that's been happening in North Kansas City. Um, they've been a great partner and our, uh, we've done two studies and we're working on another one. Get the, the third study we're working on now, uh, we're a partner on I mean, we're not a part, we're a participant on streetcar authorities leading the charge, <laughs> looking at, you know, going over the river with the streetcar. Um, and North Kansas City has been a very, you know, uh, a great study partner on, on uh, uh, the Highway 9 study that we did, lowering to grade, looking at, you know, how's that impact and make it more, more accessible in North KC. Um, so I, uh, residential growth. We have a lot of folks who work downtown who live in North Kansas City, uh, and vice versa. A lot of folks who live here work North, you know, North, North KCK, uh, North, excuse me, North Kansas City. <clears throat> um, and I really believe getting the streetcar uh, up Burlington. You tell me how far, right? Uh, really, uh, really begins to, to cross that river in a big way economically. You'll see that same kind of uh, transitory development will accelerate along that line. Um, and so you as a user coming from outside will you know come through those neighborhoods and experience them as a, as a seamless experience so we're we're big on regionalism in our lane downtown <laughs> very good well we are at the top of the hour uh some people thank you uh ann and rick for putting some links in there that uh, uh folks can do some additional research on there was a few great great questions that we didn't get to uh apologies vince and and kevin but uh We'll, we'll hopefully have a chance to follow up maybe in person sometime soon and, and have those those conversations. I want to thank everyone again for being with us today. Uh, 
we will be back again uh, second Wednesday in March. So stay tuned to uh, your uh, emails and our website and social media. And uh, encourage everyone to have a great rest of your afternoon and enjoy that beautiful, uh, sunny, mild Kansas City weather. Have a great day.